Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my Total War Warhammer Missing Legendary Lords Greenskins Edition. Now, just to give you a bit of a caveat before we kick things off, I have taken this list of Missing Legendary Lords from the Warhammer Tabletop 8th Edition, and it's the Lords that currently do not appear in the game as it stands as of this recording. And there are other characters within the Greenskin lore um, that haven't been added that weren't included in 8th Edition, but we are just going to focus on those because that seems to be the area where Creative Assembly seems to be drawing most of its units and the way it wants to proceed with adding things to Total War Warhammer from. So we'll take that as a lead to see what they're most likely to add in the near to distant future. So kicking things off, we are going to start with perhaps the most infamous orc of all, Gorbad Ironclaw. Now, Gorbad started off as the war boss in the clan of greenskins known as the Ironclaws. The Iron Claws are based out of Iron Rock, which may be quite familiar to you if you guys know the maps of the Badlands in the southern part of the Total War Warhammer map. And they had been in a very long dispute with their rival tribe known as the Broken Tooth tribe. They were next to each other, Iron Claws being located in Iron Rock and the Broken Tooth being located at Black Crag. But once Gorbad rose to prominence and became the war boss of the Iron Claws, he quickly acted to deal with the Broken Tooth once and for all. Now at some point, Gorbad managed to conquer or have the loyalty sworn to him of a group of night goblins who were from the mountains nearby. He used these night goblins to hatch his nefarious plan on how to get rid of the leader of the Broken Tooth clan at Black Crag as quickly as possible. So what he did is he rather slyly had the night goblins in all their sneakiness start to dig underneath Black Crag itself. And they spent a few weeks, if not months, doing this, and they managed to dig right under the house of the leader of the Broken Tooth's uh, actual domicile himself. Upon finally digging to where they wanted to dig, they unleashed a enormous pack of squigs into Black Crag from underneath this tunnel. And the squigs went mad. They started eating and tearing and munching down on every green skin within Black Crag. And all that Gorbad had to do was just listen to the screams from outside the gates. And once the screams stopped, he only had to open the gates and march in. At that point, all that was left of the leader of the Broken Tooth tribe was just a stain on the floor where he... <laughs> where he'd obviously met his eventual fate at the hands of a very hungry hungry squig. So having defeated their leader, the surviving members of the Broken Toothed Clan eventually pled their loyalty, pledged even their loyalty to Gorbad. This essentially doubled the size of Gorbad's clan. So Gorbad, with this much larger clan, started to march out, started to try and conquer other goblin and greenskin clans, in the mountains around the area said that he eventually grew so powerful that he ran every green skin from mad dog pass to fire mountain and everyone was subservient to gorbad so having amassed this huge army gorbad then set his sights on the stunties and he eventually started marching against a number of dwarf holds and he took a number of the smaller and minor ones and he would have the habit of slaughtering every Stunty, who was in the Carax at the time. Gorbad had learned early on that to really make an impression, you have to make people meet their ends in the grisliest way possible, as he'd learned with his experiences with the Broken Tooth Clan. He started to do, as his sort of adventures around the Badlands and the mountains in those areas started to grow more and more notorious, his deeds grew more and more legendary. There was a time when Gorbad was said to have taken on two giants at the same time and won. He's even said to have beaten a stunty army and chased them all the way to the gates of Karazakarak itself, eventually getting there, just sort of missing out on the slaughter of them by mere feet. He, in frustration, or just to simply mock the stunties, gave a mighty knock on the gates of Karakakarak, and they say the dent in that gate can be seen to this day, 
rendered by his mighty iron clawed gauntlets, as you can see on him in the model there. So having achieved some of these legendary things, words start to spread, and as often happens with the Greenskins, a war soon started. Greenskins from far afield, the areas that Gorbat never even visited, started to arrive and willingly pledged their loyalty to him in the hopes that he would lead them to glory and a good fight. At some point, he eventually earned the title, because all of these different tribes started to pledge the allegiance, the King of War Bosses and he wore that proudly. At some point, the Stunties stopped riding out to try and deal with Gorbad. His army had grown so vast, and they simply locked themselves away in their Karaks to wait out the storm of what was besetting them. So without any good fights available to Gorbad at this point, with the dwarves hiding in their Karaks, he started to set out north with his huge horde. Now, this horde had grown beyond comprehension at this point. It's almost looking at Every major tribe in the Badlands had pledged loyalty to Gorbad, and he was leading a host the likes of which hadn't really been seen since the days of Sigmar himself. And he marched on Blackfire Pass. Blackfire Pass, since the age of Sigmar, had been had been constantly fortified. People had built towers and fortresses there just to fight off this very occurrence. But such was the size of Gorbad's war at this point that it just completely brushed those defenses aside at Blackfire Pass. It said his horde was so vast, in fact, that as they marched towards Blackfire Pass, the very ground itself shook with the arrival of Gorbad's war. So upon leaving, upon breaking through Blackfire Pass, the Gorbad's war had made it into the Empire, and immediately he started sending out his wolf riders and his available spider riders to start looting and pillaging all the villages that were lightly defended and that they could kind of strike and get out of there. And so they started to loot the entire area. They met very little resistance, just their numbers were that great that they could just overcome any kind of resistance they encountered. Within a little while, they'd gotten so much loot that they, in fact, had to, Gorbad had to stop the war at an old elven ruin called the Three Towers. And he stopped there for three days just to try and sort out all the loot they'd gotten and try and get the army back in line, try and stop gobbos from stealing with other gobbos and ending up killing each other. And he just took a bit of a break to try and reorganize the wires. They just had such success that he just needed time to reorganize. And he took three days staying at this old elven ruin called the Three Towers. Now, at this point, they were well within the borders of Avaland. And the Count of Avaland... Uh, had sent word to the Emperor and just let him know that this huge war was coming. But also, because Gorbad had stopped, he felt he had an opportunity to shore up the defences. And the closest sort of major settlement that was nearest Gorbad's war at the time was the Moot, uh, the home of the halflings in the Empire. So the Count of Avaland decided to send his forces to reinforce the army at the Moot that stood there, and they thought they could stand half a chance by having a little bit of the time that Gorbad had allowed them to, to reinforce the moot and fight off the Orc War there. But little did he know that this was a foolish maneuver, and just the sheer numbers and the cunning nature as well of Gorbad, sending spider riders and spider archers around the flanks to harangue and pick off the Empire army, eventually sort of surrounding them with their sheer numbers, and wiping out the army of the Count of Avaland at the Moot. And the slaughter that followed is the stuff of legend amongst the Greenskins, the stuff of horror in the Empire. Eventually, the slaughter was so bad that only the only few survivors decided to flee, and the only survivors that could escape the war and the riders were a few of the Knights Panther on their Arabian steeds, which managed to give them the speed they needed to escape the clutches of the war. Everyone else had been left behind to the cruelties and tortures of the Greenskins themselves. The halflings, or as the gobbos came to know them, as the runts or the squealers, because they had a terrible habit of squealing awfully when you started chewing down on them. They started to expose the halflings to some terrible tortures. They would have halfling eating contests where they challenge each other to see who could eat more halflings in a limited amount of time. They used to play halfling in a barrel or barrel battles where they would put a halfling and a snotling in a barrel, roll it about and let one come out alive. 
And it was just carnage and torture. And of course, the gobos, rarely finding something of equal or smaller size than them, relished the opportunity to torture halflings and take advantage of their puny strength. A few halflings did manage to flee down the Avaland River, and this traffic was so dense with refugees at the time down the Avaland that the Greenskins set about practicing on the refugee boats with their siege weapons to get their eye in, to get a bit of target practice in, and for a little bit of fun as well. So they were not only slaughtering the ones they'd captured, but slaughtering the ones attempting to flee with their siege weapon. At this point, Gorbad's joined by even more Greenskins. These are the Greenskins who live within the Empire lands, the Forest Greenskins, the River Raiders. All the Greenskins within the northern north of Blackfire Pass had heard of Gorbad and were quick to rush to join his war. Eventually, after staying at the moot for some time, having had his fun with the halflings and collecting as much loot as possible, Gorbad sets his sights to Nullen. Now, Nullen at the time was now under the command of Brutus Lightdorf, I think it was. Now, Brutus was the Count of Averland who'd just tried to launch the defense against this war at the moot and had lost, but he himself had managed to escape to Nullen, where he was now leading the forces of its defense. Now, the Greenskins were coming from the south side of Nullen. Now, Nullen is a city built over a river. Do check out my lore video on the land of Wissenland uh, for a bit more information on Nullen and to get an idea of its layout. But essentially, to get across to the northern side of Nullen, you have to cross a river or they've built something called the Great Bridge. So Brutus, in the defense of Nullen, seeing that most of the Orc army and the war was coming from the south, decided to blow up the bridge and try and at least save half of the city. But Gorbad had anticipated this action and had the newly sworn river raiders start to ferry his orcs across the river as they approached its southern bank. So they started to do this and Gorbad himself started to oversee the construction of a floating bridge which his army could run across. So they build this and Nolan itself is destroyed or sacked. Again, huge amounts of loot for Gorbad and his war, and they have yet another victory thanks to the cunning and viciousness of Gorbad Ironclaw. There are some survivors, however, and they retreat back to Altdorf. So they're ever fighting the army back, and they retreat back to Altdorf to try and seek the protection of Altdorf's walls. At this point, Gorbad decides to move east to a certain extent, southeast, shall we say, and he decides to take on the provinces of Soland and Wissenland and raid those. Now, in a battle that would become known as the Battle of Soland, the Duke of Soland and the, the, the Count, sorry, of Soland and the Count of Wisland stood side by side as brothers to face down this or this greenskin war. And they put up a valiant but ineffective defense against the sheer numbers that Gorbad had managed to call to his side and seemed to be ever-growing. In fact, the Count of Stoland himself met Gorbad in single combat, and such is, was the strength and the size of this now terrifying orc that he simply cut down the Count in a single blow, slicing him in half. He picked up the Count's runefang, and picked up his crown, placing the crown of Solon upon his head, and chuckling to himself all the way at how pathetic these Umis really were. Now, the strength of Gorbad at this point can't be overemphasized. The more an orc fights, the stronger he gets, the bigger he gets, the more terrifying his strength becomes. And Gorbad at this point had just become an absolute monster. He was always riding into battle on his pet boar called Narla, and when he'd sliced the Count of Soland in two, he fed the remains to his mount. And not Narla or Narla happily chewed them up. The Count of Wisland, in fact, survived, however, and him and a few of the knights in the battle managed to flee back to Altdorf as well. At this point, the shamans who are traveling with Gorbad try and put some orcish enchantments on the rune fang, try and sort of tweak it to their wants and to work with orc and mork magic, but they can't really figure it out, so Gorbad, not really seeing the potential of the blade and is happy with his chopper that he has, which is very magical chopper in itself, called Marglor the Mangler. So he felt he didn't need another magical little humi sword and just threw it away, 
Uh, it's eventually found in a river and given to Kurt Helborg, one of the legendary, one of the potential future legendary lords of the Empire. And do check out my Empire edition of Missing Legendary Lords to learn a bit about him. So Gorbad and Noir have taken Soland and they start to sack it and raise it till there is not a village or town of any significant size left standing. Soland is completely ruined. And having spent days plundering and looting the riches of Soland and Wissenland to a certain degree, Gorbad finally turns his sights north and west towards Altdorf itself and begins to march his war that direction. Now, just because he's mounted and he tended to lead the mounted units of his army, uh, they were riding a little bit ahead. Seeing this, uh, the Emperor, who was Sigmundson at the time. Now, Sigmundson, during his reign and after his death, was renowned as the most one of the most prominent emperors ever to rule the empire. And he had managed to expand the empire lands sort of as far west as Bretonia and as far south as the what is now known as the Border Prince's territory. So the emperor at the time is no joke. He's in this serious contender, in fact, called Sigismund the Conqueror. And Sigismund, sort of seeing what the potential is, decides to send out, seeing the potential future siege of Oldorf, decides to send out all his cavalry. Because one might think that cavalry within a walled siege has limited potential use. So he may as well use all the cavalry we have to strike at the war now. And he assigns the just the freshly defeated Duke of Wissenland out to meet the war. And the Duke of Wissenland, having sort of seen Gorbad in action, knows a bit about what to expect and is happily to lead the troops. Uh, he himself was called, I think, Adolphus. And Adolphus, the Count of Wissenland, was at the time considered perhaps the best commander and best fighter in the Empire army as a whole. So he leads a contingent of Reichsguard, of Knights Panther, of Knights of the Blazing Sun, and they try to engage Gorbad. Now, because Gorbad was riding a little bit ahead of all his foot soldiers and the, the majority of his war, the knight saw an opportunity to strike at Gorbad himself. And this is where they had the Battle of Grunberg. And the Battle of Grunberg is quite unusual in that almost everyone involved was, it was all, it was essentially a solely mounted battle. Every soldier was mounted. So initially, the knights encounter the scouting wolf riders and they quickly manage to rout them and slaughter a good number of the wolf riders who'd been sent ahead of the war. Then they were followed up by a main corps of boar riders with spider riders on their flanks. And Adolphus, seeing an opportunity, seeing Gorbad, who at this point had been was so sort of drunk on victory, thought himself indestructible, and seeing these knights, these pathetic Umi knights, and the chance for a good fight, decided to not wait for the rest of the war before engaging, but decided to charge in. Adolphus, seeing an opportunity here, decided to engage all of the Empire cavalry that he had under his command at once, not holding anything in reserve, and they ran and charged at each other, resulting in a thunderous clash with the Boar Boys smashing into Knight's Panther, smashing into Reichsguard, taking on Knights of the Blazing Sun. And it was a furious battle. Adolphus himself screaming to all his troops, Focus on killing Gorbad! Everyone put all your effort into killing Gorbad! And Adolphus, of course, recognizing that greenskins tend to gravitate towards single leaders. And if you cut the head off the snake, that's the end of the problem as far as greenskins and their war strategies are concerned. So he had every knight in his army, under his command, focus on trying to kill Gorbad. Now, Gorbad was such a monstrosity of strength at this time that even though he was quickly isolated and just almost surrounded by Empire Knights with his boys, his Orc boys trying to fight their way to him, he was with his massive chopper cutting down reams, severing arms, cutting knights and their steeds in half with single blows. It is just carnage. He's carving through entire regiments of Reichsguard, of Knights Panther, with seemingly little effort, with just the these huge devastating swings Adolphus eventually gets close enough and manages just by sort of narrowly missing a, one of these hugely powerful swings of Gorbad feeling the air brush past his face of the blade manages to avoid it and strike Gorbad straight in the chest with his rune fang but Gorbad is such immense size that it doesn't penetrate deep enough to kill him and Gorbad grabbing the blade with his iron gauntlets pulls it out of himself with such force 
that it manages to rip off the Count's arm from the socket. Well, that was how strong Gorbad was at this point. Merely wrenching a blade away, managed to rip out the Count's arm with his socket. Screaming in agony, the Count's soldiers grab him and, said, and start to hastily beat a retreat. Uh, one of them wisely thinking to themselves to grab the rune fang out of his still twitching arm that was lying on the floor. And that is the end of the Battle of Grunberg. Although they'd managed to wound Gorbad, they still came away with losses and massive casualties just because of the sheer power of Gorbad himself. Once Gorbad had sort of managed to get himself gathered together, he waited for the rest of the war and he was so enraged that one of these puny Umis had managed to injure him that he ordered wave after wave of green skin to clash against the walls of Altdorf. But because he wasn't using any sort of artillery or anything at the time, they were just coming up against fierce resistance, the Empire was managing to fight them back, and innumerable greenskins died in this initial just loss of temper of Gorbad, just because he just wasn't paying attention, making them march through marshes, they were drowning, they were trampling on each other, it was just a mess, and he kept sending wave after wave, unrelenting in his rage against the umis who'd managed to injure him eventually his wits returned to him and he stopped sending the all of his greenskins in to just die aimlessly at that point gorbad decides to start to use rock lobbers to pound the walls down of altdorf so he waits for them to get set up they get set up and they end up in an artillery engagement because the rock lobbers don't have the range they end up in an artillery engagement directly with the cannons on the walls of altdorf now, the cannons at this point in Altdorf's history are relatively crude because Gorbad's war is occurring, if I haven't mentioned already, around the year 1707, if I believe correctly. His war lasted, I think, from 1707 in the imperial calendar to 1712. So it's over this period of time that he gathers the troops and marches north. Now, this is essentially 800 years before current timeline in Warhammer history in Total War, Warhammer, and sort of the present day in Warhammer itself. Getting back to the Siege of Altdorf, so they're very crude cannons. They're not the cannons we know the Empire has today, the masterfully crafted cannons that come out of the factories of Nullen. These are relatively crude cannons comparatively. But they still manage to destroy most of the rock lobbers, meaning now Gorbad has nothing to tear down the walls with. So he pulls up his secret weapon, now, at some point, over his travels through the Badlands, Gorbad had managed to trap and to slightly tame half a dozen wyverns, wyverns, however you prefer to say it. And in the final sort of play throw of the dice, he went, he decided to unleash them upon the city of Altdorf. So he pulls back their covers, unleashes their restraints, and lets loose six or so crazy angry wyverns into the town of Altdorf and they cause chaos they're ripping down rooftops they're killing villagers they're tearing the cannons from the battlements and they are just causing carnage one wyvern in fact manages to crash into the imperial palace itself and starts to get trapped in its halls it begins to panic much like maybe a bird getting trapped in this in a small room and just starts smashing into everything the, tr the soldiers within the imperial palace can't seem to get it pinned down can't seem to kill it eventually sigismund himself is leading a group of archers to try and kill the beast and with a single swing of its enormous arm or wing it manages to set, set aside all the bowmen and crunches down on Emperor Sigismund himself, munching down on him and devouring him nearly whole. At this point, that wyvern decides to wyvern, whichever you prefer, decides to, his hunger, mildly satiated for this moment in time, decides to try and set up a nest and sort of starts tearing down the tapestries from the walls of the Imperial Palace. At this point, having him, sur having him surrounded with him trying to sort of settle down for, for an evening's rest, the halberdiers come into the room and eventually manage, after much effort and many losses, to slay this wyvern and kill it. And that's kind of the story is repeated throughout the city of Altdorf. The, the wyverns cause huge amounts of damage, huge loss of life, but they don't attack the gate. And eventually, the Empire troops do manage to kill them all. At this point, Gorbad Khan has no real means of tearing down the walls or breaking down the gate of Altdorf. So he's starting to try and maybe wait them out for a siege of hunger. But because of the amount of sheer losses he'd sustained during his initial 
uh, assaults on the walls of Altdorf. Many of the sort of local tribal bosses started to whisper amongst themselves that Gorbad had lost a battle, they started to lose faith in his strategy, in his ability as a war boss, and they started to desert by the droves. The fact as well that orcs and gobbos don't have much patience. They're not going to sit around and starve out a city. They're going to look for the next fight. And they start to disperse. Some even go into Bretonia and cause trouble of their own. Some return to the Badlands. And eventually, all that Gorbad is left with is his tribe, the Iron Claws, and his tribe that, or what, still slightly a separate tribe, but still under his, his command of the Broken Teeth, who were the first people, the first other tribe he'd conquered. That's all that left. And seeing his numbers dwindle, and at this point being still his injury not healing, because it had been caused by the Rune Fang, that he had decided that enough was enough. He had no real choice but to retreat back to the Badlands. Now, on his march up, attacking the Karaks and desecrating the tombs for loot of the dwarves, he'd managed to pretty much piss off all the dwarves of Karaz at Karak. And knowing and keeping an eye, a close eye on the situation with this war in the Empire, they had realized that Gorbad Ironclaw was returning to the Badlands and set up to meet him there with an army of their own. So Gorbad has enough troops, although they are being harassed and harangued, there's infighting going on amongst the Gobo tribes, some of the deserted tribes are trying to fight Gorbad's tribes for their portion of the loot on the way back, some of the remnant armies of Soland, of Wissenland, of Avaland, uh, have sort of formed militia groups and are haranguing Gorbad's wars. They retreat backwards and picking off sort of any stragglers within the caravan of troops that he had going back down south. And he eventually gets pa past Blackfire Pass in sort of the area of the Border Princes. There's a mountain called, I think it's Blood Mountain or the Red Mountain. And this is where Gorbad's final battle takes place. The dwarves meet him upon Red Mountain and they engage his army. Now, no one has said what happened at the end of the battle or the Battle of Red Mountain. The dwarves, if they manage to kill him, have never mentioned it to anybody. And the last reported sighting of Gorbad was atop a pile of dwarven corpses as every other orc had either run or had been slain by the dwarves, Gorbad was still seen fighting as the sun was set on that first day of battle, and he was still hacking away at any who dared approach of the dwarven armies. So his end is somewhat mysterious. No one really knows what happened to Gorbad, but he is a legendary lord available in the orcs and goblins, 8th edition. And in terms of his weapons, I've told you his weapon was his magical chopper called Mor Morglor the Mangler. And he had his mount, Gnarla. And he also has an ability which I'm not sure how they're going to translate onto Total War Warhammer. But on the tabletop, he'd act as both a general and a standard bearer. And a standard bearer for orc armies does quite a bit. It helps quell a thing called animosity, which you see as maybe fightiness, is their version of fightiness in the Total War Warhammer game. And he sort of quells morale rolls and things like that. Now that had its advantages and disadvantages, but I think maybe they just give him particularly morale boosting abilities if they bring him to Total War Warhammer. Now I'm going to ask the question of you guys because I'm not 100% sure on this myself and I've actually struggled to find an answer for it. But Gorbad must be, at this point, at least 800 years old and I think it's unheard of for, you know what, I'm not sure how long Greenskins are meant to live. But maybe they just all die in battle before they ever approach old age. But I'm not 100% sure how he's still alive in current Warhammer continuity. Not that it matters, he's a pretty cool character. But the fact that his, conquer his conquering days are 800 years behind him, it does pose a couple of questions. But I think he is a pretty cool legendary lord and future potential legendary lord. Essentially he's kind of as badass as Grimgor, except he's got a mount. So it's like, he's sort of double threat. But um, I do look forward to seeing Gorbad Ironclaw in the game. Now, Gorbad's war with his him eventually marching on Altdorf and resulting, managing to kill the Emperor and, in fact, ruining an entire Imperial province to the point that it's never recovered and has to merge into another province. Check out my Wissenland uh, lore video to get a bit more on the details on that. Uh, but he essentially has gone down as like a fairy tale in Orc and 
goblin society. Like, shamans will tell tales of Gorbad's invasion of the Empire and his glorious victories and his glorious deeds. So Gorbad has very much become this kind of folk hero amongst the Greenskins. I think that might be a cool element to introduce as well, sort of the return of Gorbad Ironclaw would be pretty cool. So here we eventually see a bit of a diagram of Gorbad's actions through the Empire, coming up from Blackfire Pass, taking out Wizzeland, Soland, attacking the Moot, and then moving on to Nullen and Altdorf as well. It was truly one of the most successful wars in Orc and Goblin history, and he rightfully goes down as the folk legend uh, that he is today in the current Warhammer timeline. Moving on, we have Snaggler Gorbspit. Now, Snaggler hails from the Drakwald Forest. He was a member of a forest goblin tribe known as the Red Venom tribe, and they had been living on what would soon become the edge of the forest. Now, going back to the times of Sigmar and the founding of the Empire, the Empire actually unknowingly engaged in now what is now a millennia's old war with the Forest Goblin tribes when they started hacking down the Drakwald. Because the Drakwald was home of one of the holiest places known to the Forest Goblins. And that was the Black Pit, as you can see in the picture on the left where the Black Pit is slightly north of Altdorf, kind of between the wastelands and the cities of Middenland, uh, kind of around that area. And they protect the forest around there fiercely because the Black Pit is where the largest spiders in the old world are known to live. And essentially, as far as the forest goblins are concerned, these are their gods. So they will munch on as many maddening mushrooms as they can to protect their gods and to stop the Empire from deforesting the Drakwal to the extent where they ever reach the Black Pits. And so they set about attacking lumberjacks and any who venture too deep into the woods. And they really set about protecting the woodland and protecting any of the Umis from getting to the Black Pit. Now, Snaggler himself was away from his tribe foraging or scouting or whatever he was doing, and his tribe was set upon by an Imperial army, who essentially went about slaughtering his entire tribe, and he returned to find his people murdered and swore a oath of revenge against the people, the perpetrators of this crime. And he had a hatred for Humes thereafter and would set about trying to kill them as frequently as possible. So Snaggler always was a spider rider. And upon seeing his sort of beloved tribe massacred and their sort of local Arachnarok uh, killed and brought down by cannon fire, he managed to break off its, two fa its uh, fangs. And out of one of them, he made a spear and out of the other, he made a club, and these are his weapons of choice. He went on to form a company of spider riders known as the Death Creepers. Now, the interesting thing about Snaggler is one could maybe argue that he's actually already in Total War Warhammer, and that's because one of the Greenskins regiments of renowns is in fact Snaggler's Death Creepers. They're already, they were already introduced into the game, so I'm not sure if we're ever going to see Snaggler by himself. You'd think if we were, we'd have seen him with his Death Creepers. Now, the Death Creepers is the company that Snaggler formed, uh, have been going around attacking the Empire wherever they can, at one point even taking one of the Empire's walled cities. I think it's the city of Glenstadt. I'm not 100% sure on its location, but they're said to have raised that in a few years ago. And he's still continuing to harangue and harass the Empire wherever he goes. Now, Snaggler was never given a unique model in the tabletop game. The one you see on the right is, I think, one that someone cobbled together from various bits and pieces. But Snaggler's never had a unique model, so I suppose Games Workshop would be free to kind of make it however you want. Or they could argue that Snaggler's just one of the riders in the Death Creepers and you just can't tell them apart because you're racist against gobos or something like that. So they could put an argument forward, but I don't know. They might add him in at some point in the future. One of the nice touches of the Death Creepers that I like is that in their quest for revenge against all Humies, that whenever they fight a Humie army, the feathers that often don the caps of humans are taken from them by the Death Creepers, and they take their feathers and dip them in the puddles of human blood to dye them red, and then place them upon their own head headdresses. 
So the feathers that they wear, the Death Creepers, are the feathers, a sort of a macabre token of their past victories. But yeah, that's essentially it. Snaglar Gobspit, Gobspit is fighting the War of the Drakwald, as the Gobbos call it, that the Empire doesn't even really know it's in, but they're fighting to protect their sacred sites from the ever-encroaching humans on their homeland and on the Black Pit their sacred holy site where the largest spiders in the old world live. And it's a bit of an interesting take on the character because actually, from his perspective, it's really the Empire that the bad guys. He was just living in his forest happily and the Empire came in, killed all his people and are trying to, and from his perspective, trying to take over his sacred uh, lands. So it's a rare sort of hero where the, instead of just wanting to go for fightiness and being a green skin and just wanting to slaughter and kill for fun of it. He's actually on a quest for revenge because as far as he's concerned, it's the Empire who are the bad guys and who are encroaching on his land and sort of threatening to eliminate his entire religion, really. So an interesting character from that angle, but that is Snaggler Gobspit. Um, in terms of his equipment, um, as I said, he made that spear, which became known as the Sting of Snaggler, and that had poison damage and was a missile attack. So you could give him as Legendary Lord a missile attack. And he also made the Fang Spike which was the club uh, he made. And he's mounted, of course, on a spider. So not necessarily an Arachnorok, just uh, like his normal spider rider, really. So that would be Snaggler Gobsmit. And uh, look forward to maybe seeing him in the future. But as I said, there is an argument to be made that he's maybe already in the game. But maybe one to look out for. The next legendary lord we are going to move on to is... Gatilla the Hunter. Now, Gatilla the Hunter is a gobbo born in the Wolflands, which are east of the World's Edge Mountains. So it's just sort of on the other side of the mountains, not currently an area on the Total War Warhammer map. But he grew up a wolf rider in the Wolflands, as many of the Gobos in that region are. And many of the war bosses there tend to just sort of spend all their lives going around their home ranges and never really get to see the world, as it were. Never really make a huge amount of themselves, just lead their pack of wolf hunters, maybe occasionally hunting down a pack of Skaven who had come to the surface, or keeping up with the hunting of Grontelope, which I think is the local game of the area. But Gitilla the Hunter wanted something more. He wanted to seek greatness. And so he and his band of wolf hunters marched across the World Ed's Mountains uh, through the pass and entered into what is known as the Badlands and had been serving with a couple of orc bosses, um, an orc boss called Ujjaw and an orc boss called Grunters and his Boar Boys. And he's known to have built a reputation as one of the best wolf rider scouts and missile firers around. Um, obviously, his scouts would be uh, very fast. And upon his arrival in the eastern part of the world, uh, he, or the western part of the world, sorry, he set about sort of traveling around the World's Edge Mountains, traveling around the Badlands, getting a bit up north to the Border Prince territory, having a few encounters with dwarves. And he eventually encountered a huge female wolf. So it was almost like love at first sight. As soon as he saw this wolf, he's like, she has to be mine. She will be my new mount. And eventually, after about, I think it's three or four days of pursuit in the World's Edge Mountains up to its highest peak, the wolf eventually collapsed from exhaustion. And it was then that Gatilla the Hunter managed to subdue the wolf and bind it to his will. And so he managed to earn his mount who is called Alder, I think. And Alder and him have known to have built a sort of great partnership. Alder being able to sense when a battle's turning against Gatilla and being able to turn away from the fight and help him retreat when need be. Now, this on the tabletop played out as a rule whereby if Gatilla was fleeing from an engagement or running away, having had his morale broken, he was able to re-roll the distance he could run so the chasing army or the chasing unit couldn't catch up with him. Now, essentially on the, the Total War Warhammer, I don't think you could translate that very well except for making him have a particularly fast uh, wolf mount. I think that's the only real difference you could make. But that would be maybe his special rule, but maybe his wolf rider mount is maybe the fastest, faster than your average wolf rider's, something like that. In terms of his gear, he has a bone bow crafted out of a single piece of mammoth bone and stringed with wolf guts, uh, making it a very powerful bow. And Gatilla himself is known as a 
consummate archer and very good marksman so he should be more of a maybe a sniping unit a mounted sniping unit as a legendary lord which the yeah the greenskins don't really have so that might add a unique flair to him his other piece of gear was the stinky pelt which was made of gruntalope fur presumably from Gatilla's homelands of the wolflands and he brought it from there and it gave him a particularly uh, good uh, set of armor to have as well now he has also got a unit that tends to march with him called the howlers now the howlers i'm not sure if you could count as being in as one of the regiments of renown i know that one of the regiments of renown for the greenskins are the moon howlers but his reg his uh, unit is just referred to as the howlers so i'm not sure if they're meant to be the same thing or they're meant to be different things but either way if you want to put forward the argument that maybe games that maybe Creative Assembly would put forward for um, the Spider Rider Legendary Lord, then you could maybe if you said the Moon Howlers and the Howlers are the same thing, you could maybe argue he's already in the game. But I think he'd add a unique, a very unique Legendary Lord for the for the Greenskins because he would be a Missile Legendary Lord, of course. But suffice it to say, at this point in time, he's renowned as probably the best Greenskin scout around that any war could have. So he's become a very famous Gobbo and he's kind of got his boyhood wish of making a name for himself and getting out there and seeing the big bad world and all the monsters and and humies it has to offer for you to kill so he's having a great time exploring making a name for himself generally being an all-round good gobbo lad next we have the big one quite literally grom the paunch now grom was a gobbo who was part of a tribe known as the broken axe tribe and one day as a member of the broken axe tribe grom was always known for having a bit of an appetite and maybe he got a bit overzealous and started to eat raw troll. Now, if you cooked the troll meat, you probably wouldn't have had any problems. The fire would completely negate the troll flesh healing factor. But Grom, being particularly hungry on that day, had eaten the meat raw. And this meant that the troll meat would start to grow in his belly and start to heal and regenerate and essentially make more and more and more and more and more of itself. Now, a lesser troll would have probably just exploded. But Grom suffered and he went through what is now known amongst the Greenskins as the Battle of the Belly, where he started to grow enormously in size and girth and his stomach swelled to hugely abnormal and almost scary proportions due to the troll meat within his stomach. They say that the day that Grom ate the troll meat was in fact the last day he would ever manage to see his legs again. But the troll meat had allowed him to grow to such a size and to such significant strength that he didn't really care if he could see his legs. He had such strength, and strength is really all that matters in Orc society, that he could just order people to look at his legs for him, was his argument. Grom starts to conquer, and he eventually becomes, and starts to fight amongst the tribe, and he eventually becomes war boss of the Broken Axe tribe. Now, their neighbors uh, had a war boss called Zook Gutstabber, and they were the Gutstabber tribe, and there was known to be some animosity between the two, and the Zork uh, Gutstabber was in fact an orc. And historically, orcs have already bo have, or have always bossed around gobbos and told them what to do, and gobbos either ran away, much like the forest goblins did, and lived in their own society, or gobbos just did what they were told by orcs. Or alternatively, they just got killed by orcs whichever way you want to look at it. At some point, Zook, I think, decides to attack a close-ish tribe of night goblins. And the night goblins go to Grom and they say, Grom, this guy's attacked us. We usually have to do what he says, but can we seek shelter with you? We're kind of running away. And Grom goes, it's enough of this. Us gobbos have suffered for too long under the boot of the stupid orcs. I'm going to go and sort out this problem. And he hoists his axe over his shoulder and by himself sets off towards uh, Zook Gutstabber, the war boss of the Gutstabbers. And Zook, getting word from his scouts that Grom was on his way by himself with his axe, kind of laughed off the notion. He was like, oh, let this fat gobbo come and see. Let's see what he can do. He thinks he can take on an orc boss. What a, what a silly sod. 
And so he says, let him through, let him through, don't ambush him on the way, give him free passage straight into our be- straight into our camp, and I'll take him on one-on-one and we'll put him back in his place. And the rest of the gobos that follow him. Grom eventually gets there and, and Zook's sitting there waiting for him for a challenge and laughing at him as he approaches with his huge, enormous, wobbly belly. But he is quite big for a gobo, so Zook, Zook takes it mildly seriously. And they challenge each other to a fight. Now, Zook is a muscly, huge orc. He's a strong, big orc. And he's much more sinewed and muscly than Grom. But Grom's still quite a big guy. He has a lot of weight to throw around at this point. And they engage in a duel. Now, one could argue that Zook is maybe the better fighter. And he lands the first blow. He lands an axe straight into Grom's stomach. A blow that would kill any other greenskin. And he watches in disbelief as he withdraws his axe, and Grom's stomach almost heals instantaneously. At that point, Grom strikes, dismembering Zook, and that does not heal back, unfortunately. And so Grom tries to claim leadership of the Broken Axe tribe. But because there are a lot of orcs underneath Zook, Zook was a strong orc, but there's a lot of orc big boys in that camp they're like we're not going to take orders from a gobbo so they all set upon him and it takes him slaughtering every single orc big boss in that camp and then eventually they become subservient and they're like okay fair enough we will (laughs) you'll be the boss grom you take it from here at that point in the duel grom's quite exhausted after battering all of these orc big bosses and he goes to take a seat and unfortunately, he sits down on and to all the gobos in the crowd and all the gobos who had sort of arrived at hearing of his victory to celebrate with him. All the gobos see him sit on one of their fellow gobos, a night goblin. He sits on him and everyone assumes like as soon as he stands up, all that's going to be left is a mucky stain just for how huge and bulbous and enormous Grom is. But much to everyone's astonishment and amazement that when he gets up, He is unharmed, the night goblin he almost sat on. And no one can believe what a stroke of luck this little night goblin had. How did he manage to survive that? And from that point on, Grom kind of adopted this night gobbo as his little mascot, as his sort of lucky friend. He was like, you must have some astonishing luck if you managed to survive me sitting on you. And I think he named him Niblet. And Niblet became Grom's standard bearer. And you can see him on the picture there to the right, just hiding behind Grom, holding up the standard. And here he is in the center picture as well. So Grom and Niblet become sort of slightly inseparable. And he's the standard bearer. And Grom's the one who's just sort of axes people up to death. And they start to gather a huge horde. And a huge number of gobos particularly hearing about Grom's success and Grom's strength start to, start to flock to him. And much like they did many hundreds of years ago for Gorbad Ironclaw, a war starts to form. And tribes start to say, and let's go join Grom. He's hugely strong. He's doing amazing things. Let's go and see what he can do. Grom, having now amassed a large wall made of up of hundreds of greenskin tribes, um, decides to start to attack the Stunties and loot and pillage some of the Stunty holes. So they attack and raid the tombs along the way and attack some of the smaller Karaks. But unfortunately, a lot of the gobos, seeing the sheer enormity of the size of this war that has formed on their doorstep, uh, quite wisely and quite sort of towards their character and what they seem to have always done, go and hide in their larger carracks and behind their very secure walls. Now, this sort of leads Grom to kind of attack all around, and unlike uh, Gorbad before him, Grom doesn't have any sort of necessity to uh, attack these hugely fortified places. He recognizes the strength of the war and just goes after maybe some of the softer targets, destroying sort of the smaller dwarven carracks and raiding the tombs and getting lots of loot. In fact, upon one of these uh, engagements, they run upon a statue of Grungi, who's one of the ancestor gods of the dwarves, and he orders his boys to hack, up, hack at it until it looks like him and uh, move on. Now, the not only had he raided tombs and hacked up a statue of their god, but the workmanship on the statue of himself was so poor that this eve only went to further enrage the dwarves, who had added Grom to their book of grudges and had now set their sights on eventually destroying his war. Now, being so enraged at the desecration of the statue of their ancestor god, the dwarfs send out an army led by King Bragric at the time. 
and that army engaged Grum's War, which led to three days of fighting. And eventually the two sides separated, the War had suffered a number of casualties, but the casualties on the Dwarven side were just horrendous, and the Dwarves couldn't support that kind of casualties. Whereas Grom just had ugh, thousands more gobos and orcs and war buses coming into his ranks every single day. So the Dwarves retreated behind their Karaks and sent, and much to, not their shame, but out of sheer desperation, they sent emissaries to the Empire to ask for help. Now, unfortunately for the Dwarves, at this point in the Empire's history, the Emperor is Dita the Fourth, and immediately upon hearing the news from the Dwarven from the Dwarven emissaries, he doesn't send any troops or anything, but immediately withdraws all of his uh, court and most of his troops from Nullen, which is where the capital of the Empire had been since the reign of Magnus the Pious and withdrew them further west towards Altdorf in an act of cowardice. And this, in fact, earned Dieter the eternal name of the emperor who ran. So no aid was coming in the near term from the empire to help the dwarves. So they stayed locked up behind their Karaks, and Grom was unable to breach any of their major holds. And so he started to march north towards Blackfire Pass. At Blackfire Pass, his war had reached such gigantic proportions that he simply brushed away the fortresses that were guarding the pass, and he started to rampage all over Stirland and Talabakland and and even got as far as Hockland. Now at this point, he's sending his war, he's spreading his war wide, trying to loot as much as possible from the entirety of the Empire. So having met little to no resistance from what at the time was a very poorly run and poorly defended empire because of the largely due to the mismanagement of Dieter the fourth that Grom was able to send his war far and wide and have them spread fairly thinly and start to really loot and raid from the entirety of the southern part of the empire the only holdout really of the provinces he had trouble with or that, that any of his raiding parties had trouble with was Reichland where the very brave and very wise Prince Wilhelm of Reichland who was the cousin of the emperor at the time, whenever he note recognizing that the war had spread itself thin, didn't cower behind his gates in fear, but would actually ride out and manage to destroy many of the raiding parties sent into Reichland. Now this preserved Reichland, which at the point at this point is very much the breadbasket of the Empire, because so much of the fields and the mills had been ravaged by this orc war that had seemingly happily trudged through most of the Empire at this point. Uh, Reichland was the only one that still had fields that could provide food for any of the coming months. So really, Wilhelm is stopping its almost single-handed, well not single-handedly, with his army, the Empire from starving to death. But Dieter refused to gather troops, refused to sort of march out himself and meet Grom, and really just hid it out of fear in Altdorf, with his cousin, coincidentally. Now, part of the horrible mismanagement of the Emperor Dieter IV was that his spending proved to be entirely frivolous. He let uh, defensive fortifications like those that had been overwhelmed at Blackfire Pass rot away over the years, and instead he spent money on marble arches and marble statues of himself in Nullen, the capital. He spent money on this rather gaudy new palace for himself, which would become known as the Golden Palace. Now, Grom at this stage had ransacked a lot of the southern part of the empire and was looking for a new target. The hearing of the news of this golden palace, he figured this is going to be the loot of all loot. I'm going to head to Nullen. And essentially, because this money had been spent so poorly, there were a few cannon compared to what there may once have been defending Nullen, uh, Nullen soon fell to the hordes of Grom, and Grom and his fellow gobbos made themselves at home in Nullen, doing all sorts of activities from torturing the citizens to chariot races for fun. They really settled down in Nullen as their main base of operations while they continued to raid almost freely throughout the empire, with exception to Reichland, which I mentioned earlier. So, at this point... 
Grom is starting to get a bit lazy. He's not as sort of driven as maybe Orc bosses might have been to go on and get another fight. He's happy sitting on his piles of gold in the wreckage and ruins of Stirland, of Talabak land, making his, like, gobos have games, torture any of the local inhabitants they'd managed to capture, do gobo chariot races around these cities, and he really becomes a bit of a sort of pompous dictator and isn't really focused on where to conquer next, where to go next. And eventually, one of his now close lieutenants, a shaman known as Old Blacktooth, sort of had a trance and had a vision within his trance uh, that the Gromwa had to go to see. So at this point, Grom listens to his, his friend and confidant, the Old Blacktooth, and he's like, all right. And he just sort of shouts out to all the boys around him, all right, boys, we're going west towards the ocean. And they all get up and the whole entire war starts to shift towards at initially really the northwest. So they go up through Middenland. And at this point, Grom has taken to riding a wolf chariot, as you may have seen in the earlier images of him. So he's taken to riding a wolf chariot and a army of Middenland decides to ride against him. And they're met with the enormous war as he gathered it as it stands at the time. And they set about just slaughtering the Middenland army. And they get into Middenheim itself and start to sack and ruin Middenheim. Now at this point, uh, during that battle in fact, Grom's chariot had been shot out from a cannon from under him. So he gets his boys to actually chop up the roof of the Temple of Ulrich, which is the god the Middenlanders uh, pray to more than Sigmar actually. This is a huge act of sacrilege and he makes his new chariot out of the roof of this temple uh, as a sheer mark of disdain and disgust. So he's got his lovely new chariot and he continues his march to northwest. He continues to raid across Nordland leaving it in ruins and ash and eventually gets to the shoreline of the empire. At this point he orders all his boys to put together whatever they can or whatever excuses for ships they can sort of cobble together. So over the next three months, they're by the coast. They occasionally come up against armies of men. Again, their masses and numbers lead to the slaughter of empire armies that even try to stop them doing what they're doing. And they start to build up the ships. And over a course of three months, they eventually have their, well, what passes for an armada, the best the orcs could come up with. So they set sail. And now the Imperial Navy, uh, having caught word of this, is quite fearful, but not really knowing that the orcs and gobos can't be particularly good seamen, the admiral of the navy at the time decides that really they just have to keep an eye on them. They're keeping their distance, um, but they just have to keep an eye on them. And the weather and the tides and the poor seamanship of the greenskins will probably kill most of them off anyway. And sure enough, yeah, some boats do sink because they're just that poorly put together. Some get lost in sort of the ocean tide, some drift out to the open ocean. But for the most part, the Armada manages to stick together and manages to sail south. And they're following the coastline of the Empire at this time. And so they're quickly approaching the mouth of the River Reich. And so that is where Marienburg is located. So Grom the Ponch is quickly approaching Marienburg. And at that, at that point, Marienburg is still part of the Empire, I believe. And at that, so the, Emperor, the, so the Imperial fleet says, OK, we have to step in here and engage them. And they engage in a fierce and a bloody sea battle. In fact, the Imperial Navy loses over half of its number. And they do make a dent on, the, on Grom's on Grom's war and they do sink a number of ships but it's not nearly enough the war is just that vast the amount of troops he has and gobos and orcs he has at his disposable is just so huge that they haven't nearly made enough dent and just when things seem lost and Marienburg seems inevitably to be taken the weather shifts the weather kicks up a huge storm and for the rest rest of really uh Grom's fleet gets pushed out to sea, many of his vessels are sunk, and really it's a saving grace for Marienburg at the time. But Grom's saying, all right, well, fair enough, we got pushed out to sea, that weather was bad, let's continue on our trek west, as the shaman told us to in his vision. And after a little while, they eventually come to a shingle beach covered in mist, and hundreds of the orc ships have managed to survive to this point, and they land on the what they don't know, uh, but what t ends up being the island of Ulfwan, the home of the High Elves. 
And so they wash up on this sh on this shingle beach and immediately start to send out wolf riders. Now they'd lost some of their wolf riders and the wolves had started to eat themselves at each other. But to be fair, the ones that survived were the biggest and baddest wolves they had. So they weren't too bothered about that. One one of their wivens had managed to survive in the hold and he was let out. And he started to munch down on a dozen or so gobbos before the shaman old Blacktooth managed to calm the beast and eventually claim it as his own mount. So now Grom with his chariot, his mate old Blacktooth the shaman riding above the army with his wyvern, start to raid and attack the High Elves. And the High Elves sort of, event, sort of at the first aren't really sure what to expect. Firstly, they can't believe that an Amada's managed to make it to Ulfwan. Ulfwan itself is protected by very powerful magics. And to get past all the magic mists, all the magic protections, to get past the vast amount of sea monsters that they have patrolling the, the, the shores of Ulfwan, rarely has a single ship managed to get past unscathed and land on Ulfwan, let alone an entire fleet of hundreds of orc ships. It's either incredibly powerful magic they used, or they were incredibly lucky. I personally like the incredibly lucky thing, and I like to think it was all down to Niblet. Uh, Grom's lucky night goblin who had managed to survive the Grom sitting on him and had been apparently blessed with luck from that day forward. But anyway, this in, this huge one, and off one had never, had not really ever gone through a greenskin war before. And because there are quite a, a minimal amount of elves alive at this point, they're just overwhelmed by the sheer numbers. There are just so many gobbers. Uh, now, one elven knight can probably hack down close to a hundred gobbos, but even at those rates, like, it wasn't nearly enough to be able to overcome the entire war of Grum, of Grum. So eventually they start scouting around, and Grum's looking for a city to try and take. And to the north of where they landed, there was a city called uh, Tor Yvres. I may be pronouncing that wrong, please forgive me if I am. But I think it's Tora Ivres. And on their way up, they encounter a number of elves. And they encounter a number of what look like white waystones around the island of Ulfwan. And Old Blacktooth tells Grom that they need to destroy each of these as they go. And what these stones effectively do is these stones are part of an ancient spell. Whereby all the excess of fell magic and chaos magic uh, of the world is sucked into them. I think into them, by it sucked into these stones uh, to try and protect the world from being overpowered by chaos magic and chaos entering the world, much like it had done in the first chaos invasions. So the High Elves had managed to fail them by putting in this spell, and Grom, this silly gobbo, and his black mage had started to undo all of these waystones that were part of the spell and protecting the entirety of the world from annihilation from the armies of chaos and by destroying these uh because all of the chaos magic is being drawn to Ulfwan to be to be sort of drained out of the world the orc shaman blacktooth is becoming ever more powerful every one of these stones that are destroyed because more and more chaos magic is still being concentrated in that area and with less souls and with less of these stones to sort of negate it um essentially it's just a shaman sort of drowning in huge amounts of winds of magic and it begins to drive him a little bit mad and people can start to visibly see sort of magic fell magic like pouring off of the shaman but suffice it to say, he still serves in the army. He can still get stuff done. So Grom doesn't really care. He's like, all right, do whatever magic-y stuff you're doing. I'm going to keep slaughtering these pretty elves. So they eventually get to the city called uh, Tori Vress. And there's a, there are walls around it. And the Gobbos are pretty impressed at the prettiness of the city. But they love chaos. So they start getting their rock lobbers out, built out of the remains of their ships. And they get the rock lobbers out and start bombarding the city. And the city put up a stout defense. But eventually, the elven army does come out to meet Grom the Ponch in his war. And Grom's plan is, okay, we'll meet them infantry to infantry. And then all my gobbo spider riders and my chariot riders will go around the flanks and will encircle them. And indeed, that's what he does. And most of the gobbos there and the spider riders are relatively ineffective. But Grom himself, riding upon his 
fierce wolf chariot with his mighty axe was just causing carnage. The blades on the wheels of his chariot were hacking down the legs of high elves and they were sort of being dismembered left, right and centre. His mighty axe would lop off two or three elven heads with every swing. Uh, he was just decimating the elven ranks. Uh, with, of course, Niblet by his side, uh, maybe granting him a bit more luck with his swings, who knows. The elven army that rides out is eventually defeated, uh, the remnants of that army retreat back behind the walls and the bombarding continues, and eventually the gobos break down the walls of Tori Vess, and they start to capture the elves and torture them and behead them, as you can see in this image here, and they just start to cause chaos in this city, Old Blacktooth now starts to circle the city, and it's at this point that the elves realize that with the amount of stones that have been destroyed, that the entirety of Ulfwan is now in danger. If one more of these waystones is destroyed, uh, it's believed that Ulfwan will just sink into the sea and be completely annihilated. But Blacktooth doesn't care, he's gone mad. He thinks that we're on his on his wyvern, if he rides above it, then once that, once this last, this sort of last waystone before the sort of the dam is broken, as it were, is destroyed, then he will take in all this chaos energy and unleash a wave of slaughter upon the entirety of the world. He'll become that powerful. And at this point, he's gone completely mad, and he just wants all the power from himself. And he thinks he's about to become the most powerful magic yielder in the entirety of the Warhammer world. And at this point, lightning cracks out of the sky. And an uh, elven captain known as El Elfarian uh, emerges from the clouds upon a griffin, casts lightning at Old Blacktooth, and while swiftly striving by, manages to decapitate the old orc shaman with a single swing of his blade. Now, El Raf Elfarian uh, was bringing with him a host of elven reinforcements, and they all began to charge into the city, massacring gobos as they went, and eventually we're seeing old black tooth slaughtered in front of their eyes as they flew above all of them, seeing the lightning raining down from the magic of Elfarian. The gobos panic and all start to break. At this point, Grom starts to, tries to start to win them round, but their fear and panic is such that they just all break and the war of Grom is broken. So they scatter, the elves ride them down, slaughter as many as possible. They're all running out of the city of Tori of Rest. None of them are concentrating on any of the waystones or anything like that at this point. And that's really the last recorded history of Grom. It said he disappears after this battle. No one's really sure what happened to him. Now, this was all around the year 2410, I want to say. 2410 onwards, so it could have been a couple of years either way. So this really wasn't that long ago in the timeline of Total War Warhammer. And there are rumors that Grom had sort of disappeared into the mountains near Tor of Res and had been living there with the survivors of his war ever since, building their numbers and perhaps building their strength. Now, I think Grom is a great character with a great little story behind him, but I don't think we'll see him until the second game. Um, and I think we'll definitely see him then because there's no real other greenskin threat on Ulf 1, assuming he survived and is living on Ulf 1 at the moment. So it'd be great if you are going to have a greenskin presence for a high elf player to fight early on in their campaign, it would be Grom the Ponch, who's currently based in Ulf 1 uh, for the high elves. So in terms of Grom's equipment, he has his axe, uh, which is called the Axe of Grom, or later earned the name Elf Biter, and his Lucky Banner, which is held aloft by Niblet, which is just called the Lucky Banner. So I think uh, maybe have Grom and Niblet form a duo. I think that'd be great to see them as a two-man a two unit uh, who ride on his chariot. And maybe the axe gives is obviously just a powerful magical axe. And Giblet's uh, banner maybe gives Grom extra melee hit chance or something like that. In terms of special rules, of course, Grom can regenerate thanks to the troll meat he'd consumed much earlier in the story. So if he does appear in Total War Warhammer, he should have the ability to regenerate. But I really hope we see them both on the wolf chariot that he may eventually get. And Grom really is a great little character there. And look forward to seeing him in Total War Warhammer. And that about does it for the missing legendary lords. Uh, there are other, of course, uh, 
green skin characters, but those are the guys who made the cut in the uh, 8th edition of the game who aren't already in Total War Warhammer, like Wurzag and Grimgor and Azag. That about sums it up for us. I really look forward, I particularly look forward to Gorbad Ironclaw and Grom the Ponch. I think they'll definitely make it into the game. As I said with uh, Gatilla the Hunter and Gorbspit, uh, they, Gorbspit, there's the argument that he's already in the game, and Gatilla the Hunter, maybe as well, if you say the how the, the moon howling wolf riders are the same as the howlers, you could maybe argue he's in the game already. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what Games Workshop do in terms of these legendary lords. I definitely think we'll see Grom the Ponch with the second iteration of the game when you get the high elves and the and the dark elves and the lizard men. I think he'll turn up on Ulf One, uh, maybe as a boss for the high elf campaign. Probably not, but probably as an early encounter. You'll, you'll see on Off One just to give you something to fight apart from Dark Elves to add a bit of variety there early doors. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, I'll pop up some other videos I have on Warhammer lore and the missing legendary lords from the Total War Warhammer game. Uh, please do check them out and uh, subscribe for more coming up in the future. Thanks very much for joining me on this one and I uh, hope you all have a great day. Thanks again.